Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I welcome a certified professional accountant who has also spent time as a contributor to many magazines that I'm sure some of us are very familiar with. Our discussion covers, in a broader form, financial literacy. So, what is financial literacy, why is it important, and why should an entrepreneur care? Financial literacy is the ability to understand the use of various financial skills, including professional management, budgeting, and investing. For example, knowing the difference between savings and investing both aim at increasing the amount being put away, but one might come with a bigger risk and higher reward. Example given, investing. Now, there are several important benefits for financial literacy. Understanding how much the entrepreneur earns and spends is the baseline of financial literacy. And this goes beyond the world of entrepreneurship, departmental budget, organizational budget, household budgets. Once the entrepreneur has a budget, track spending to ensure those purchases costs remain within the budget. In fact, there are several budgeting methods that I would encourage the listeners to research to find one that fits the specific budgetary needs. Financial literacy also helps understanding how to avoid debt. Debt may be unavoidable, so understanding how to limit that debt is part of financial literacy. Seeking out lower interest rates and comparing terms can save a substantial amount of debt over the long term. Take the purchase of a home, for example. Understanding the difference between a fixed interest rate and adjustable rated mortgage could be anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollar difference. And this is also true with small business loans, personal loans, credit cards, anything that has an interest rate attached to it. Another example is in home equity line of credit. Avoid refinancing a home to take a vacation or purchase something that is not providing the same amount of equity it is costing to pay back that loan. Spending more on a remodel than the value the remodel will provide in return is a sunk cost, which means the money that has already been spent cannot be recovered. Having financial literacy also helps the entrepreneur protect themselves. In this episode, we talk about rainy day funds, also known as emergency savings account. Ideally, this savings account should hold three to six months worth of expenses. This strategy can also provide protection from bankruptcy. Lastly, please secure for retirement. Financial literacy includes understanding retirement stocks versus bonds, IRAs versus 401ks. This will help the entrepreneur begin to establish generational wealth. Generational wealth includes financial aspects such as property, investments, money, or anything with monetary value that can be passed down from one generation to the next. And that is why the entrepreneur should care. Gaining education in financial literacy allows the entrepreneur to build a better future for our communities, our families, and for our economy. As one former guest once said, if our community isn't doing well, our businesses never will. Together, we are a community. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Houston. This episode is sponsored in part by Burnside Knives, essential tools for outdoor enthusiasts and working professionals like yourself. Visit BurnsideKnives.com. Your knife says a lot about you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I am very excited because we have a Forbes contributor who writes over the Forbes magazine, also a CPA, Melissa Houston. How are we doing? Hey, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here and talk with you today. I'm really excited because I, I, you were talking a little bit earlier and, um, 
I hate financing. I'm going to be honest. I, <laughs> I, that, you and most people. That was accounting <laughs> and, and like, I don't, trying to figure out when a bond's going to appreciate. I don't, I don't know, but I tell you don't what, know, don't care. I don't care, <laughs> but I'm going to pay somebody to figure it out. So Melissa, let's introduce the world to you. Who is Melissa Houston? Yeah. So, um, my name is Melissa Houston and I have been a CPA for over 20 years. However, this was not my first career move. My first career move was in social work. So I worked in social work for about six years. Then I moved into business administration, became a CPA, and I've been working all things accounting and tax since since then. And a couple of years ago, I decided to go out on my own and help entrepreneurs and business owners with optimizing the profit in their business so that they get to keep more money in their pocket and increase their net worth. Who doesn't want more money in their pocket? Exactly. So let's, let's take a step back first for the, for the listeners at home. What is a CPA? What, what, what does it stand for and what does it do? Okay. So a CPA is a certified professional accountant. So what that means is CPAs go to school for, you know, we do our undergrad and then we go to school for an additional four to six years learning the ins and outs of accounting and finance, right? So it's, it's grueling and we have to have that work experience in order to get certified as a professional accountant. And we are governed by, well, our governing accounting body to ensure that we are following the uh, rules of conduct and professional ethics that are required of a CPA. So you know that when you hire a CPA, you're getting good quality candidates who are educated, experienced, and ethical. So it's almost like you went to undergrad and then you wanted more torture. And so you went for an additional yes. six years of school. Yes, that? exactly. And it was tough, especially when um, I was finishing up school with two babies. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> yeah. So where'd you go to school? Yeah. I went to school, so I'm Canadian, so I went to school at Carleton University and Athabasca University, and then I got my CPA. Nice. So let's little, let's talk a little bit about the, the technical things of, of money, right? Mm-hmm. Um, let's Love let's, talking about money. Yeah, let's kind of dive into <laughs> it, because I think this is going to be a very informative episode for the listeners. So let's first, let's start out with just the basics. What's the difference between profit and revenue, and which is better? Such an important question because so many entrepreneurs out there confuse the revenue numbers as being what is the indicator of how successful their business is, right? And I'm not arguing with the fact that revenue is not imperative to business because it is, it absolutely is. But the thing is, if you're bringing in a hundred thousand dollars in revenue or a million dollars in revenue per year, if you don't have that profit margin or those profits to help your business sustain and keep growing, then essentially your business won't survive. Like if you're losing money continuously, your capital resources will run out and you will have to close shop. Yeah. You know, a great example, I think for the listeners is Tesla, right? It it creates a lot of revenue, but it Mm -hmm. hasn't turned a profit, you know, so, but it's, I think it's starting to, right. It's getting to there. And that's, that's kind of why you hear a lot of, especially like a stocks, you hear like revenue and profit, right? Now Mm -hmm. let's, let's, Let's kind of take another little step back and, and talk about, let's talk about financial power. What what does mm-hmm. it mean giving away financial power? Oh, this is so important, especially for women. I mean, men too, but it seems to, in my, in my experience, affect women mostly, where it can be viewed on so many different levels, right? First, if you're in a relationship and you're giving all the financial power to your spouse, that is a red flag, right? You need to get involved in your finances. Financial health is extremely important for you. But the same thing goes for your business as well, right? So if you are hiring professionals like CPAs to help you, I mean, absolutely, that's what we're here to do. We're here to help you. But it does not give you permission to check out of your business finances, right? You still own the business. You are the ultimate decision maker of the business. And if you don't understand what's going on in your finances, you really are falling short of being the best CEO of your business that you can possibly be. Because all your decisions should be based on whether they are profitable decisions for the business or not. And the only way you're going to understand the profit is if you understand your business business numbers. It's totally acceptable to have bookkeepers, accountants, CPAs, tax accountants, financial advisors, whomever to advise you and give you the best financial advice you can get because that's what they're there for. But if you don't understand the decisions that they're telling you to make, 
that's a red flag. Yeah. yeah that, that's so true. You know, just, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, I'm starting this, you know, podcast and I've been telling the listeners, you know, going through this process and it's kind of important to be the jack of all trades sometimes, you know, especially if you're an entrepreneur, yeah. because you kind of have to test everything that you're going to ask somebody to do. And that's kind of what yeah. makes a good leader as well, right? If you're going to ask somebody to get on their hands and knees to scrub a floor, as a leader, you should be willing to get down on your hands and knees and scrub with them. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Melissa, one of the things you mentioned um, was kind of women in particular having some of the issues, right? Kind of going through a lot of things. In fact, a lot of your Forbes articles are around women business. Yeah. What are some... Uh, in your perspective or in your experience, what are some hurdles that women tend to have to deal with more than other and that you particularly see? Oh, where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, the world has changed a lot, especially in recent years. However, you know, I have over two decades of business experience and dealing with the second guessing and oppression of women in the workplace, BIPOC, um, whomever. I mean, that is real. That exists. And that is an issue. I mean, there's a lot of men out there who only want to deal with men. There's a lot of women out there who only want to deal with men. There's like a lot of validation in, you know, maybe the man knows, knows best the man, you know, and that's, that's definitely a hurdle because um, that's not necessarily the case. I have worked with amazing CPAs that are both men and women. And I have worked with terrible CPAs that are both men and women, right? So it's it's a non-gender thing. And when it becomes a gender thing, it gets very frustrating, especially for those who are completely confident in their roles. And the, the frustration that I have that I see often right now is although we are making progress, there's less than 3%. And in fact, over the pandemic, it's actually shrunk. That number has shrunk since the pandemic of women receiving VC capital. So that's frustrating, right? So the, it's more likely to go to men than women. And then for BIPOC, it's even lower. Um, there's not enough representation on, on boards. Women in BIPOC are not on boards and that needs to change. The C-suite, you know, yes, we're getting more women in there, but it's still not enough. So, it, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues that still need to be addressed. Yeah, that, that's you brought some very valid points. In fact, one of our former guests who, in fact, their their organization, Founder Gym, it's a local Oregon organization that founders and actually really coaches them to go in front of the venture capitalists and, and work on trying to get some of that funding because it is so difficult for the BIPOC community and, and mm-hmm. females. Now, M- Melissa, you coming in through the, the financial world, have you ever had to face any type of the adversity uh, for being a female in your current world, the, the CPA Oh, world? Absolutely. Absolutely. Continuously, This is part of the reason why I did choose to leave as well, right? Because when you're being controlled by others who are making decisions for you, that's very frustrating. You know, you know yourself best. You know what you're capable of. You know that the sky really is not the limit and you know, or the limit of your, your limitations. Right. Right. So, um, you know, when I always say when people are being faced with that, it's time to, you know, seriously look at the situation and see how you can change it for yourself. If people around you are not willing to change, you have to change. Yeah. Yeah. Now you mentioned you, uh, you kind of left CPA briefly or, or are you currently a CPA and you're currently, no, I'm a CPA. I, I will, I will remain a CPA. I left being in the corporate world. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. So you left the corporate world um, to kind of become an independent. Proprietor. Exactly. Start my own business and do my own thing and reach my goals. Yeah. Right. And I have exceeded my goals in my wildest dreams. Right. So it's, it's been an amazing experience so far. Yeah. Let's, let's act. In fact, before we, let's talk about Forbes a little bit, cause you're, you're writing for Forbes. How did, how did that kind of uh, materialize? I know this is like one of the most popular questions I get. <laughs> Tell us about and, the magazine. <laughs> yeah. And, and it'll surprise most people that what I did was I cold pitched them to see if they wanted me to write for them and they were on board. So, you know, like I got over the fear, I got over the intimidation of putting myself out there publicly. I, I just, it was like jumping off a diving board, right? Like I knew (laughs) I could do it, but it was having the courage to do it. And then once you did it, it's like, wow, that wasn't so hard. (laughs) You You, you just slid in the DMS. I'm telling you, I've I've been telling folks, you know, cold calling is not a dead form of outreach, Mm -mm. Uh, you know, sending out an email, sneaking into the DMS. 
uh, trying to get their phone number or even sending snail mail still works for some organizations. Yeah, building relationships. How important is networking for you? Networking is absolutely important. And this is one of the things I absolutely love about writing for Forbes is because when I get to feature women who are doing amazing things, I get to help them get their story out there and then build relationships with them. And it's not just through Forbes. I mean, I meet people such as yourself through podcast guesting, having my own podcast, just meeting people. And I started my business right when the pandemic hit, you know, like it was bad timing. But on the other hand, (laughs) I still was able to meet so many fabulous people, great connections. And the thing about networking is it goes both ways. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't realize that it's more like, you know, let me take, take, take from you. It's like, no, 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 you got to give too, right? You have to reciprocate. It goes back and forth. It, that's so true. In fact, you know, I, I wrote an article, I believe, um, about the different uh, different teams that are out there, right? Twitter has their, their spaces. Facebook has their groups. There's different communities out there that entrepreneurs can engage with. However, Mm -hmm. as an engaging entrepreneur, you can't go into those groups expecting everything and not giving anything in return, right? Exactly. It has to be, it has to be a two way street and that that, you have to lead with value. That's very important. Yeah. Let's let's talk about value. How do you provide value to your clients? To my clients? Oh, wow. Okay. So I love to coach. So I offer business coaching services. And for those who are ready, I do the done for you fractional CFO services, but no matter what I'm, what type of service I offer clients, it involves coaching because I walk the talk, right? Like I want to ensure that even though I'm helping you make decisions, that you understand the decisions that you're making. You understand what's going on in your business so that you can advance your business and grow your business and optimize those profits. That's so important to me to see my clients make more money that they get to keep for themselves because there's so much money wasted, you know, like other people, other corporations are getting this extra cash when they could be keeping it for themselves and lining their own pockets. Very true. In fact, you you mentioned coaching. So I'm going to ask you some, some questions to help, help us entrepreneurs out. So first, why are cash reserves important for an entrepreneur? Yeah, I mean, we've especially seen this during the pandemic, right? So cash reserves are important because economies fluctuate continuously, right? So, you know, whether your industry is having a great time during the pandemic, or you've unfortunately had to close your doors, if you're at that time where you're doing really, really well, at some point, it will, like, you will be in a lull. The cash may dry up. The customers may dry up. There's always dry spells in a period. So having that cash to help you through those hard times is extremely important because cash is the lifeblood of your business. So if you lose access to cash and the sales are drying up, you have no more cash coming in, but you still have those financial obligations going out, then ultimately what's going to happen is unfortunately your business is going to close. Now, 82% of businesses fail due to financial mismanagement. So the number one thing you can do is monitor your cash and ensure that you've got cash reserves to get you through the slower times. Nice. And you know, for the folks at home, I I kind of equate this to um, when you're buying a home and they say you need a rainy day fund, you know, it's kind of, kind of similar to that, right? Cause it It is very similar to that, you know, and, and same thing, I think like almost any market, you know, I used to do real estate in the past and peaks and valleys, you know, you just have those peaks and valleys where currently right now, real estate, we're at a peak, right? But if you guys remember 2008, we were at a very deep valley, right? And, exactly. and we might hit another it's valley. Such a good soon. example. You know, we might hit another valley soon. So it's imperative to kind of make sure, uh, you know, I'm not a financial advisor either, you know, but it's it's just important to make sure you're, you're checking your finances. And, and one thing I talk about too is like maxing out your IRA, right? Putting that 19.5 mm. away, putting, you know, making sure you're, if you can bring down your overall taxable salary, right? So it's under, instead of 24%, you're at 22%. Or if you can get down to 40,000 a year, then you're at 12%. That's a huge mm-hmm. 10%, right? So huge. what, why does it, uh, what, what are some in money management tips for scaling? So if I wanted to scale my business, what are some tips for entrepreneurs? Yeah. So everybody loves growth, right? Growth in the business, they think more money's coming in. So I'm doing really, really well. But the thing is you have to be careful with growth because what, what comes with growth, growth is increased expenses. So knowing 
And planning out your growth is really important so that you don't run out of that cash, right? And that happens quite often in growth. So not all growth is created equal. So I always recommend when you are like when you are wanting to grow your business, create that financial plan that's going to map out the next 12 months and how you want things to go and reinvest those profits into growing the business. Don't go out and take out big loans and, you know, all sorts of stuff like that when you don't necessarily need it. You know, be careful with the debt that the debt amounts that you carry because that, you know, ties into your cash reserve and plan out that growth and ensure while you're growing that your profit margins are staying tight. Because if your profit margins are shrinking while you're growing, what that means is that you're working harder to get the money in the door. So bigger profit margins are always most desirable. Nice. And so for the listeners at home, what is profit margins? Profit margin is essentially a measure of how hard or easy it is for you to bring in the profit in your business, right? So profit divided by your sales is going to equal your profit margin. So it's just really important because when it comes to economies of scale, like I'll explain. So if you have a hundred thousand dollars of revenue coming in and you made $10,000 of it, your profit margin is 10%. So if you maintain that 10%, when you have a million dollars of revenue coming in, your profit margin is going to be a hundred thousand. Right. Yep. So there's a very big difference between 10,000 and 100,000. So if you think that keeping 10,000 when you're making, you know, a million dollars of revenue, that's a 1% profit margin. So that means you're working harder to keep that profit in the door. Yeah, that's a great example. And one thing I constantly tell these listeners, you know, we got to focus on working smarter, not harder. Right. Yes. Right? So important. Now, one of the things you also mentioned was expenses. And I kind of wanted to I want to talk about that a little bit. In your mm-hmm. experience, what are some expenses that entrepreneurs overlook? Hidden hidden costs. Hidden costs. I mean, they really are everywhere. I mean, the one that comes to mind always is decent subscriptions. Oh, I've not met a client okay. yet. <laughs> has I'm, not. I'm dealing with that right now. <laughs> okay. You've got these subscriptions that keep going and you're not using them. Yep. So that's a really easy way to save money is to go through and, and cancel subscriptions that you don't need. Your advertising costs. I mean, that's huge, especially for online businesses that are using Facebook ads right now. That is a huge money sack with the change is the iOS 14 changes or what have you, it skyrocketed your ad spend and not necessarily giving you the return like you used to, right? So monitoring your marketing and your advertising and your dues and subscriptions are huge. Um, Ensuring that you are looking at all the expenses in your business and seeing where you can cut and where you don't necessarily have to cut, right? Meals and entertainment, um, travel, in group coaching or these coaching programs are huge expenses for a lot of entrepreneurs. And you may need to look and see if that is really something that you can afford to carry. And then for product-based businesses, it's really about, you know, ensuring that you have, um, you know, adequate inventory levels, that you're not overflowing with inventory so much so that you're spending on at the beginning and waiting for the cash to come in later and struggling with that cash management balance. Yeah. And, you know, you brought up a, a really valid point in the food and entertainment uh, cost for mm-hmm. not only entrepreneurs, but households, right? Individuals, yes. you know, it, this this is a, all inclusive to everyone. Uh, in fact, me and my wife just recently went over our last year's financing, you know, tax season's coming up. So we're like, well, let's see how much we spent on our food and entertainment for last year so we can try to be mindful I'm not going to tell you the number, folks, but let me tell you, my jaw dropped, and I ain't me, I ain't eating no more dinners no more. Yes, I, I got to stop eating out now. One of the exactly, things, especially with the food delivery now too. Oh right? man, you know it's kind of funny. You you buy a ten dollar meal that's going to cost you thirty dollars to be delivered to exactly. your house. Exactly, and it's such a money suck, but it's so easy to do. I am victim of that too, and I have to stop doing yeah. it. Right, it's, it's, it's just the, the convenience. The convenience, like like a uh, like valet parking. I don't need yeah. valet parking, but I'll, man, $10 just so I don't have to, cool, let's go park my yeah. car, man. That's fine. I'll yeah, pay for it. exactly. <laughs> I know we have to stop that. Yes. Now, one, <laughs> one of the things you mentioned too is, uh, as is one of those expenses is advertising. Now, yes. how do you, as a CP, how do you advertise yourself? 
I do a lot of organic advertising. So, um, you know, just getting out there and networking, right? Networking is key for me and getting referrals in the door and doing affiliate projects and such. So that's really how I, I pull my clients in is just organic. I don't pay for advertising. That's that's very smart. And I kind of tell folks too, you know, that's kind of the way we've been building the shades of entrepreneurship very organically. I'll, I'll take quotes from some of our speakers. I'll throw memes on Instagram to bring in folks. Uh, but mm-hmm. really this is all word of mouth and we're, yeah. we're continuously growing, uh, every day, which is, which is really cool. You know, as, as one former guest say, builders build kind of thing. And that's, yeah. that's kind of where we're at. <laughs> so how yeah. do we, you know, as entrepreneurs, how do we forgive ourselves to build a better tomorrow? Yeah, that is such a good question. I love that because, you know, part of business is making mistakes, right? We, especially when we're starting it, we make tons of mistakes yep. and to sit there and and blame ourselves and say oh we could have done this better or if I had only known I you know blah 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 whatever whatever stories you're telling yourself you need to forgive yourself for mistakes because through mistakes is learning right if you're walking away with that valuable lesson that mistake is worth it as far as I'm concerned so being educated knowing you know like for example now knowing that 82 percent of businesses fail due to financial mismanagement that should be a key to educate yourself on business finance, right? So now you know better, you're going to do better. But to have been in a situation where maybe you have lost um, a deal, lost some money along the way, lost, you know, made a wrong choice, whatever, you have to just forgive yourself, get up, learn the lesson and keep going because resiliency is, is such a key for entrepreneurs. Definitely. And now what about your career? Have you ever had a moment of self-doubt? Oh, for sure. Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> we you all know, I'll tell you a story of, of recent, actually, because um, I recently just got a book deal. Nice. And yeah, yeah, I'm super excited about it. But along the way, I kept hearing your audience is too small. You won't get a book deal. Publishers are looking for big audiences, big platforms, the whole stuff. So, of course, I was filled with the self-doubt, right? Yeah. But I'm like, I am going to try anyway. And what's the worst that can happen? They're just going to say no, and I won't get a book deal. But I got the book deal. So, you know, I feel it, but I just keep going. I love it. Let's 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 talk about the book. What do yeah. we, what is it coming out? What's the title? So the title right now is Cash Confident, an Entrepreneur's Guide to Financial Management. Now that could change depending on, you know, the process um, for the book, but it should be coming out mid-2023. Nice. I can I get a signed copy? Absolutely. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, guess. I gotta I gotta ask it. <laughs> So how did, exactly. how did, how did the book come about? How did you uh, get to that point? Well, because like, I'm so, okay, first of all, I love writing. Like I write for Entrepreneur and Forbes and other large publications. And I think writing is another great way to get the message out there to entrepreneurs, because I believe that, you know, financial management in your business is so important. It's such valuable information, but not a lot of people are talking about it. So I just wanted another way to reach people. And I thought traditional publishing, where it's going to be on bookshelves and bookstores and, you know, around the world is a great way to get people's attention and get them interested in learning more about finances. And what does the book kind of cover? Does it kind of go just like a a quick overview of, of how to be successful financially? goes through a lot of what I discuss with my programs and such. And, um, you know, a lot of case studies, a lot of, a lot of stories so that people can relate and understand the importance of the messages that I'm trying to get out there. Nice. So as a CPA, what keeps you up at night? What's that thing that you are always thinking about for either for your clients or for yourself? What's that one thing that kind of keeps you up at night? And maybe it's not one thing, maybe it's multiple things. Yeah, that's a really good question. Cause You know, I I think the thing that keeps me going mostly is ensuring that I can help as many people as I can possibly help, right? So how am I going to get a further reach? How am I going to, you know, just reach the people who really need this advice, right? Because there's so many different ways you can consume the content because there's tons of content out there. Um, you know, so whether you're, you're reading the free content or you're signing up for coaching or you want fractional CFO services, it doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is that people understand how important it is and how much better their business will be when they manage their finances. Very, very true. So if folks want to get in contact with you, they're interested in learning more about Melissa Houston. How do they find you social media, webpage? How do they, how do they look you up? 
Yeah. So my main website is melissahoustoncpa.com. And if you go there, one of the first things you'll see is the ability to download the five-step roadmap to biz finance freedom. And that outlines my five-step framework for entrepreneurs. And then on social media, I'm on Facebook and on LinkedIn and Instagram at Melissa Houston CPA. Nice. So folks, you heard it here, melissahoustoncpa.com. There is a free book waiting for you online. And then next year, 2023, a new book coming out. Very excited. Melissa, thank <laughs> you so much. I'm I'm so excited. I think we're going to have a lot more discussion after this as well. I'm very excited. I'm really excited for your book as well, because as I mentioned, I'm not a financial guru. I just pretend to be one. Uh, and again, folks, I'm not a financial advisor. Please, please, please do some research on financial gains and profitability, revenue, making sure you're maxing out those IRAs, you know, just think, always think, um, if you're giving away 50% of your money to the IRS, then something's wrong. (laughs) 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 We got to figure it out. Well, listen, thank you again so much for being on the show today. I really do thank appreciate it. Thank you so it. much for having me. This has been such a fun conversation. This was great. Thank you so much. I'm again, I'm excited for your book. For those folks at home, you can visit me on LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram and have a great day. Thank you for tuning in to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow the Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.